Grenzer fahren. Diese Geschichte ist aufgearbeitet worden. Diese Geschichte ist erstmal auch im Detail noch mal rekapituliert worden in einem Film, der heißt, äh, wir haben ihn ja mittlerweile in deutscher Übersetzung äh, vorliegen, äh, O. Jeremy Corbyn, äh, die, die große Lüge. Es ist eine Produktion von linken Filmemachern aus London. Ähm, das Kollektiv heißt Plattform Films. Und jetzt habe ich die Ehre und Freude, eine Protagonistin dieses Films zu begrüßen. Herzlich willkommen, Jackie Walker. Hi. Ich muss mich hier ganz kurz präparieren. Ich muss natürlich unseren Gast noch mal äh, vorstellen. For decades has been active in the workers' movement until 2016. She was vice chairperson of the grassroots movement Momentum, which supports Jeremy Corbyn and his project, and that was the initial purpose of the movement. From 1981 on, she's been a member of the Labour Party and was part of the radical left wing of the party. But she's also a member of the Jewish support group for Jeremy Corbyn. The Jewish Voice for Labour is the name of this group. And this group also plays an important role in the movie I'm talking about. And Jackie, that has to be added, is as also known in the UK as somebody who fought against racism tirelessly and who also had worked in the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. She was very active in this movement. You must say, we're going to be looking at a couple of excerpts of the film now and we want to talk about the film. But going back to the rise of the Corbyn project, we want to talk about how that became a mass movement. Und äh, man muss wirklich, äh, muss ich jetzt so ein bisschen in die Zeit zurückversetzen, die hier noch gar nicht so lange vorbei ist. Sozusagen das britische Proletariat, ähm, 2015, die Augen wieder aufgeschlagen hat, open nach their einer eyes langen, langen Schockkoma, period of being durch sort of shock coma through Thatcherism and Blairism äh, erlebt äh, hatte. Und, äh, mich hat sehr I was very impressed von Corbyn, wo to er hear an election hat, speech of Corbyn where ja, he said in front of masses, rise nach einem langen Schlaf. like the lions after a long sleep, Anzahl, rise in your Ketten numbers, ab, shake off your chains, Schlaf auf like euch gefallen the dew glaube, that has settled on you in your sleep. And I think that sort of gives you a sense of the mood that was there. Now, before we talk about this with Jackie, we're going to briefly look at an excerpt of the film now that sort of gives you a sense of the mood of the time then. So if we can see part one of the film now. I think people have had enough of the politics of celebrity, the politics of personality, the politics of abuse. Keep writing, Jeremy. You're the Thank best you. thing that's happened to our party in 30 years. Thank you. The Labour Party offered hope to millions, and half a million people joined, became Labour members. Biggest party in Europe on the left, and a really exciting time. All over the country, we're getting these huge gatherings of people. I was absolutely ecstatic. I mean, I've been aware of Jeremy for decades, and I knew what fantastic leader he would be. They're young, they're old, they're black, they're white. 
all ages, many outlooks, many people who've never been involved in politics before. It was an incredible feeling, and I guess I just remember feeling very, very hopeful at those times uh, and thinking that, God, we, we might now be in a party that is a, a genuine vehicle for, for radical change. I was used to going to Spurs, and I could hear that as a football chant. Was, uh, and it's the big Spurs man at the time was Musa Dembele. And people used to say, Oh, Musa Dembele. And then I hear it on the train, and it wasn't Musa Dembele, it was Jeremy Corbyn. And so there were uh, youngsters who were taking it on and were breathing life into politics. I mean, that must have been an amazing moment, and you were part of it. Could you describe that a little bit from your perspective? I'm sorry, I kind of find it hard to go back to those times because there was so much hope, there was so much excitement, there was so much energy, and we had been working so hard on the left year after year. You know how you do you know, having meetings and doing all that. And suddenly there were people, just ordinary people, poor people who were actually coming up to us when we were campaigning. And they, I mean, one, one thing I remember very much from where I live, I live in a quite poor area of London, 50% people of colour. And I remember at one point speaking to women who were going to go to the election to vote. And they had come home after a night duty, carrying heavy bags with children. And there they were, and they were going, and they were saying, no matter how tired we are, we're going to go and vote. And it was that kind of amazing energy. And you can see from that film, that's Glastonbury, that's young people mostly, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands suddenly politicised. It was an extraordinary moment. But, you know, one of the problems was that the moment that it happened, I suppose what you could say was um, there weren't the material conditions to see through what was actually a cultural revolution in many ways. We had been fighting the far right locally. We had defeated, I don't know if you know the name, Nigel Farage and UKIP. We had seen, really, the rightward flow of politics. We had seen the Conservative Party becoming fiercely Brexit, fiercely racist, really having been taken over by, by UKIP. And actually what that did was not just galvanise those of us on the left who had always been activists. I think for many people, they just thought, we can't stand this anymore. We need a change. And so you had hope. You really had hope that this time... I'm beginning to sound like one of those kind of love songs, you know. This time, it would actually be different. And that was the kind of energy that there was. Man merkt sehr deutlich, wow, wie really get a feeling durch diese Zeit how bewegt this hat time wie moved diese you Zeit auch and sicher was in dir verändert how hat. It really changed uh, something in you, I'm sure. Und jetzt kommen wir gleich and zu dem Kontrast. We're going to uh, show the contrast sehr here, a very uh, ugly attack gegen diese Bewegung. against this movement. Um, we need to say perhaps as well that at the end of the day it was a, a media war unleashed, not just unleashed by the media, but the media were the main weapon in the war with which it was waged. And we're going to get a few impressions now from this war in order to be able to understand what effect this war 
I had. And we're talking here about the instrumentalization of anti-Semitism, accusations, but it's at the end of the day about the instrumentalization and exploitation of the suffering of Jewish people who had to suffer through this. And this was done in the most impudent manner, blatant manner possible, and how this can be done and what Jewish people of the left say, we will now hear in the next section. So this would be clip two if I could ask for that. They tried smear after smear, but in the end, only one stuck. There, there is a big lie everywhere, and one of the big lies of our time is the lie of the uh, uh, Labour Party being infested with anti-Semitism. They redefine anti-Semitism. They redefine it so that uh, if you are critical of Israel, that is by itself anti-Semitic. I was accused of anti-Semitism by my Tory MP for demonstrating outside an arms factory in my local town, Broadstairs, with the campaign against the arms trade. It happened to be Israeli-owned factory, and that was seen as anti-Semitic. I doubt if there's a single Palestine solidarity activist in this country who has not been accused of anti-Semitism. Anyone who issues any criticism of Israel is, according to them, anti-Semitic because they re redefined anti-Semitism. It's not opposition, it's not hatred or hostility to Jews as Jews. Uh, for the Zionists, anti-Semitism is op opposition to a Jewish racial supremacist state. For years, Corbyn had spoken up for the Palestinians and condemned Israel's illegal occupation of their country. His enemies now put all this down to a hatred of Jews. Many Corbyn supporters would deny being anti-Semitic, but would admit to being anti-Zionist. What's the difference for people who don't really know what this is all about? Well, anti-Semitism is the hatred of Jewish people, and anti-Zionism is the fight against a colonial settler um, state which is oppressing a people, the Palestinians. It's all the difference in the world. So now we've just, we've just heard what strategy was applied. We're very familiar with this strategy here in Germany. Anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism are equated. That's how it is. But I don't want to get into that discussion particularly. We've just heard, though, now what ammunition was used. But who fired the ammunition? That's what I want to know. Who was firing the weapons? What forces? We know it was the right-wing members of the Labour Party, the British establishment, but there's not that much talk about the Allies. It was the Zionists, but it was also right-wing extremists. Tell us about that. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just describe when I first realised what was going on, which was actually before Jeremy Corbyn was actually elected, I was, we were having um, an anti-racist meeting locally and we were speaking and suddenly we had far, the far right turn up at our doors. Now, we'd had this before because in our area we had fought against Nigel Farage getting into Parliament and we'd done it super super successfully. He didn't get into Parliament. I'm very proud of that campaign that we wage. So we had quite a strong ultra-right neo-Nazi groups around us. But suddenly, they were knocking on our door and calling us anti-Semites. Now, we, we just had no idea where that was actually coming from. But that was the first time that we realised. And, and actually... It was at that point that Nara, Na, uh, Farage's uh, UKIP paper, uh, which was also published in America, started accusing me of anti-Semitism. And so it was a total puzzle. But this was a number of groups on the far right 
who decided that to tack on anti-Semitism to attack the left was going to be very effective. And I, can I just say, one of the reasons that it is effective is that on the left, it is our a natural response to be internationalists and to be anti-racists. And so what happens is if somebody accuses you of racism, you just don't tell them to, you know, go away. You kind of question yourself. That's the normal thing you do. And that was the Achilles heel of the movement and the Achilles heel of Corbyn as well. Nun, ich habe sehr intensiv verfolgt, äh, wie du auch äh, Now I very intensely followed how you were involved in the discussion in the British left and how you commented critically on how the left was dealing with these accusations. But I'd be interested in knowing how Labour establishment dealt with these accusations of anti-Semitism. I mean, the right wing of Labour, they weren't particularly interested in anti-Semitism at all in the past and suddenly they were massively interested interested in it, and they were suddenly huge supporters of Jewish people. So that was one part of the question. And the other part of the question is, you're criticizing, you're saying, but there's, there's a very strange, unappetizing hierarchy of racisms within the Labour Party, and you have gone further and even said there is an open kind of racism directed to black people and people of color in the Labour Party. And I wonder if you could explain how that all fits together. Okay, well, I mean, you know, the right of the Labour Party are like centrists every, everywhere. I mean, most of them are not interested in any kind of anti-racism. They just use it as a cloak when they feel like it, when it suits them. So in the same way that they're not interested in uh, anti-black racism or anti-Muslim racism or anti-Gypsy racism, they weren't really interested in anti-Jewish racism. I mean, you can know that because under Starmer, more Jews have been expelled from the Labour Party than ever before. It's unprecedented. If you're a Jew in Starmer's Labour Party, you are six times more likely to be expelled than if you're a non-Jew. So let's just be frank, this has nothing to do with race. Let's just put that away. But of course, they were extremely happy to use whatever tool appeared effective. So what you had was a confluence of interests from the pro-Zionist lobby from the right that worked this whole um, uh, uh, cauldron of filth, actually. It was filth. And the victims of it have been anybody who is actually seeking to find racial equality and liberation. We've all been the victims of it. Um, and the second question was, sorry, your second question was? Well, I was also asking about racism against ah, yeah. black people and people of yeah, colour yeah. within the party. So, so I have to tell you one of the reasons that I was expelled as somebody who's both um, a black person and a Jewish person, was that I actually said that there was a hierarchy of race <laughs> in the Labour Party. You say that and you get expelled. Now, if you look, just like I've said, you know, the proportion of Jews being expelled is actually massive. We don't have figures because the Labour Party don't keep figures. But let's put it that way, if you're interested in this, have a look at the Ford report. That was a report commissioned by Starmer. And what that showed is the level of racist abuse and expulsions, not just with ordinary members, but actually within the party bureaucracy. And it was targeted not just at members, but actually at quite well-known black MPs as well. And what we also know, and I only know this anecdotally because, as I say, they don't keep data on this, is that the amount of black candidates now has just fallen hugely. 
You go into a local Labour Party, even in the inner city, I mean, the representation of people of colour or mis Muslims is never that high, but it's totally plummeted now. And what happens is, is race is now an acceptable political uh, football within British discourse, and the newspapers are thrilled to have it that way. Now, you just talked about all the people who have been excluded from the Labour Party. And if you want to describe it, you have to say it was like a purge, a huge wave of purging. Everything that could possibly be oppositional was just pushed out of the party. And I think that triggered a huge shock. I don't think anybody expected that, or hardly anybody. And when people realized what was actually happening there, these were people who had worked for labor for, you know, 10 years with the, their heart's blood, we have to say. And there was then a movement resisting that. And to get a couple of impressions of that, we're going to look at clip three. Corbyn's suspension was the beginning of Starmer's witch hunt. It was open season on anyone who dared to show support either for Corbyn or for the Palestinian cause. insisting that the withdrawal of the whip from a long-standing elected Labour Party Member of Parliament is absolutely unforgivable and anti-democratic. And we're also standing up for all those members who are now in waves being suspended for resisting the anti-democratic, increasingly authoritarian tendencies of the leadership. You cannot have paid officials of the party telling party members what they can debate. Groups within the Labour Party who opposed the suspensions and expulsions were prescribed. Anyone who joined or supported these groups, even before they were prescribed, were automatically kicked out. Local parties across the country were paralysed. I think this excerpt shows that the protest against this wave, this sort of purge of the opposition, and the repressions was being resisted. The resistance that we've just seen here, though, seems a very sad, weak resistance. And then I'd like to ask you, I mean, you were there, you were, you organized, you were involved in organizing. Is that impression correct? And, and if that is the case, why do you think that is the case? Uh, well, first of all, you've got to understand that none of the media reported any of this. What you're seeing here is not reported by the media. The mass expulsion of Jews, not reported. What's happening to blacks, not reported. The fact that you're not allowed to discuss uh, votes of confidence within the party against Starmer, not reported. The fact that you're not allowed to vote on support for Corbyn, not reported. And I'm just giving you the tip of the iceberg here. So the whole of the press, the whole of the media is not reporting this, that's the first thing. Then you've got to understand there was mass expulsions. When I was expelled, I think I was the second person to be expelled. It was really unusual. But by time 
it was being used by Starmer, you're talking about mass expulsions and also hundreds of thousands of members leaving the party. So the party which had been the biggest uh, uh, political membership party in the whole of Europe at 600,000, I think it's lost 300,000 members. I mean, that's absolutely vast loss of membership. So uh, there's also another thing which I must mention, which is the psychological effect on Jews, on non-Jews, on black people, on Muslims, of being expelled for racism. This is not just an objective feeling you have. It actually makes you sick to your stomach. And you don't just get that. You have a campaign of hate against you. So for a lot of people, they want to keep it quiet. They don't want to tell people what's happened. This is a proper witch hunt that's going on. And naturally you have to say that, you know, you've mentioned Keith Starmer. Keith Starmer, he played a key role, of course, in these developments. And he played a very disingenuous game, first of all, presenting himself as a supporter of Jeremy Corbyn. But at the end of the day, he stabbed him in the back. But it has since transpired that he got support from outside as well, namely that the party was undermined to an extent that you have to describe as criminal, politically criminal. And then he could act as the caretaker, the huge savior of the party, who at the very last moment came there and prevented the terrible disaster with his infiltration. And at the same time, he tried to make himself be a statesman defending British values and all of this. And what kind of scenario that is, I'm sure you'll comment on that in a moment. But we're first, before we get to you, we'll show this next clip. Al Jazeera has obtained the largest leak of documents in British political history. Oh my God, this is unbelievable. It is absolutely shocking. Hundreds of thousands of internal communications expose how operatives secretly take control of Britain's Labour Party. The Labour Party is a criminal conspiracy against its members. Free speech was shut down. They tell the inside story of how Sir Keir Starmer, who could be Britain's next prime minister, leads a lawless party. I love this country. I'm proud of this country, of all it's achieved and all it will go on to achieve. This country has given me so much. An NHS that cared for my mother for much of her life. The chance to be the first in my family to go to university, to go on into the law and to lead our Crown Prosecution Service for five years. The United Kingdom is founded on values that I share. They're the values of the Labour Party that I lead. And to all of our supporters and affiliates, I say this. Whether you voted for me or not, I will represent you. I will listen to you. And I will bring our party together. Did Starmer succeed in uniting the party? <laughs> it's the kid's time uniting the party. I mean, it's got to be the biggest joke in the last 30 or 40 years, isn't it? I think that gives you an impression of the insidious scrupleness, uh, lack of scruple that were exerted here. I would be interested in hearing, though, how you interpret this coup, as it eventually was, and the intelligence services that were clearly involved in this. What aim was pursued here, apart from not having Jeremy Corbyn be prime minister? 
Look, there's been research done on all sorts of issues about the links between Starmer and not just the British Secret Service, but other Secret Service, particularly when he was working as Director of Public Prosecutions. And I'm not going to go into detail about that. People can have a look and find that. But just let me point out the fact how strange it is that a man who's only been a member of a Labour Party for five years and only a member of Parliament for kind of that long suddenly becomes the leader of that party. It's, it's an amazing rise. It's almost unbelievable, isn't it? But, you know, what we see in Starmer is someone who was quite prepared. I mean, he's, he's great at it. To lie to get to where he wanted to be. He gave the members during the election for leadership 10 pledges, which was all about really being a socialist. He has now broken every single one of them, every single one of them. He is an extraordinary uh, uh, dissembler of the truth. Um, it's been very effective, but he could not have done that without the support of the Parliamentary Labour Party, who overwhelmingly are not just, you know, to the right of Corbyn, but they're actually further right traditionally than the Labour Party has been, I think, for some time. So he couldn't have done it without their support and without the support, I'm going to say it again, of the media and the support. I mean, it was very clear when Corbyn was coming up for the election and the generals of the army actually said, and they made this public, if Corbyn becomes prime minister, there will be soldiers on the street. So it was that clear that this, this whole thing has been a coup, a well-organised coup, to lead us to where we are. And where we are now is with somebody who absolutely says he will change basically nothing as to what the Tories do. He'll just be a better bureaucrat. He will just administer their rules better. And in that way, I think what's going to be really exciting is if, and the prob probability is he will get in, when he gets in, that will be the time to look at what the left is going to do because that is when real struggle is going to happen. Also, we have here tatsächlich keine Verschwörung. Well, it's not a conspiracy theory here. It's a proven conspiracy with evidence in practice here. Now, we've reached a point in the conversation now where there's incredible sort of tension, and we could talk about this and analyze it all day. And normally, what I would say is, okay, let's figure out what the conclusion of this can be and deliver some kind of conclusions. But I think what we're going to do is actually stop here, because things will continue, but not today, tomorrow. Tomorrow, we're going to hear Jackie at length with lots of analytical points as well about the mistakes of the left and what some of the project, the mistakes have been of Corbyn, of the left. What can the left learn in Germany and elsewhere? Are there parallels, maybe? If you look at the attacks of the NATO opportunists in the left party or allegedly left party here and how that's affecting us in Germany. So these are exciting things that we're going to be discussing tomorrow. And if, if you've had the opportunity to watch the film in full length and listen to the story in more detail tomorrow. So Jackie's got some time for us again tomorrow. She'll be talking to us She's for a, a full hour if she wants. And our editor-in-chief is going to be having a conversation with her after you watch the film tomorrow. So come to the world premiere to the Babylon Cinema at 2 o'clock. There's still some tickets, not that many as I've heard, but there still are tickets for tomorrow. If you go to the Jungerwelt stand in the foyer, and if there are some 
tickets left, you'll be able to get them at the Junge Welt stand at the demonstration tomorrow. And all that remains is to thank Jackie Walker most cordially for telling it like it is here and making it very clear with what you said, just how important this project is, and that it's really something that contains lessons for all of us. Thank you so much for coming to us today from the UK and for being there again tomorrow. We are so grateful. Thank you very much. Susan, vielen Dank. Thank you, Susanna and Jackie.